Hello, my name is Hedivi Turbo. I'm an interdisciplinary scholar, and my research examines issues relating to childhood, state violence, and sexuality. I've been invited to speak about the insights we can gain from bringing into dialogue two bodies of knowledge. One is critical legal scholarship, and the other is critical childhood study. The insights we'll discuss in this video can be grouped under three themes, fluidity, violence, and human faces. Under the theme of fluidity, we'll see that neither legality nor the child are matters of fact. First of all, law is never simply respected or violated. Instead, it operates through competing interpretations. And second, children are not simply a pre-given group. Instead, they're largely creations of the law, and their supposedly natural characteristics could diminish if legal norms were to change. Under the theme of violence, we'll see that both law and childhood are violent. They inflict, legitimize, and conceal violence, especially against disempowered groups. And under the theme of human faces, we'll see that law is embodied not only by legal professionals, but also by non-lawyers. Similarly, we'll see that childhood is embodied not only by the young, but rather by people of all ages. All these insights challenge conventional wisdom and hopefully they can provide a richer and more critical understanding of both law and childhood. So let's start with the concept legal and the concept child. Many scholars take the meaning of these concepts for granted, but the truth is that neither legality nor childhood has any particular essence or meaning. Instead, both of these concepts are inherently fluid, ambiguous, and elusive. So let's look at the way in which scholars think of problems concerning children. Often these problems are described as violations of legal norms. And this gives the impression that there's only one correct interpretation of the law, and that the problem is that law isn't properly implemented. In other words, the assumption is that the law is always either respected or violated. So legality is viewed like an electric switch, as if it were something that can be turned on or off. But this view is too simplistic. Critical legal scholars argue that law is a constantly changing product of discourse, of imagination, and of social practice. And what this also means is that concepts such as legal and illegal are not simply matters of fact. Instead, these concepts are discursive constructs, which are inherently fluid and elusive. Now, there are other reasons for the fluidity of the law. First of all, every legal principle is open to competing interpretations. In fact, that's exactly how the law operates. Law is a battleground of competing interpretation. In addition, there are endless conflicts between one legal principle and another. If one principle seems to lead to a particular legal outcome, then another principle can easily be used to justify a different outcome. Let's take a look at one example of the fluidity of the law. It has to do with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which is the most widely ratified treaty in the world. This treaty requires states to assure to the child who is capable of forming his or her own views the right to express those views freely 
in all matters affecting the child, the views of the child being given due weight in accordance with the age and maturity of the child. But what do these words actually mean? When is a child capable of forming his or her own views? What falls within the scope of matters affecting the child? What is due weight? And what is in accordance with the age and maturity of the child? All of these legal phrases are open to competing interpretations, which depend on the ideology of each decision maker. In addition, childhood itself is a fluid legal category. For example, there's no uniform legal distinction between childhood and adulthood. Instead, the law imposes different age limits for different purposes, such as compulsory education, drinking, alcohol, driving, work, medical consent, sexual consent, voting, and military service. This leads us to the next point, which is the broader fluidity of childhood beyond the law. Legal scholars have increasingly problematized categories such as gender, race, sexuality, and disability. But when it comes to childhood and adulthood, legal scholars only rarely display such critical awareness. Instead, legal and social thinking tends to assume that differences between children and adults are mostly natural, universal, and pre-given. But critical childhood scholars have long challenged this conventional wisdom. They reject the assumption that childhood is a pre-given and natural fact. Instead, they argue that childhood itself is an idea that was created through discourses and social practices. And law in particular has played a central role in the social construction of modern childhood and adulthood. After all, it's the law that obligates school attendance for some of society's young members. It's the law that establishes youth courts or juvenile court. It's the law that excludes many of the young people we call children from work and civic life. It's the law that forbids their exposure to so-called age-inappropriate content. And it's the law that promises to give them special protection. In addition, the law shapes and regulates the boundaries of childhood. It does this in several ways. First of all, it uses certain labels, such as minors, children, and youth. Second, the law introduces age thresholds, such as those for compulsory education, employment, and criminal majority. And finally, the law also imposes minimum ages, such as those for driving, drinking, using social media, voting, and so forth. In the past, things were very different. For example, age-related legislation was rare and it wasn't usually enforced. When people in prisons started being separated, it wasn't by their age. Instead, they were separated by their perceived character, the severity of their offense, and whether they had a prior criminal record. Over time, the law has increasingly reserved different sites, different experiences, and different actions for different age groups. This historically recent model of childhood is also culturally and socioeconomically specific, but it's been increasingly spread across the world through international legal norms. So as we can see, the law doesn't simply regulate or respond to pre-existing children and adults. Instead, law is heavily implicated in the social production and reinforcement of childhood, adulthood, 
and age differences. And this also means that if these legal norms were dismantled, age differences would probably diminish significantly. This invites us as scholars to imagine what society could look like under a less ageist legal order. So far, we've talked about the fluidity of both childhood and law. But if law and childhood are fluid, that also means that they can easily lend themselves to violence. And scholars don't always pay enough attention to the violent nature of both childhood and the law. Now, violence doesn't only mean physical or psychological harm, that one person directly causes to another. Instead, many scholars define violence much more broadly. They argue that violence is part and parcel of the way in which society is organized. For example, whenever social practices, discourses, and institutions limit how people can live their lives, this is a form of violence. As we'll now see, both law and childhood are deeply violent. And part of what makes their violence so effective is the fact that it's ingrained into social norms and institutions, so much so that it's not perceived as violence at all. Now, there's a, some, a common assumption that law is a solution to social problems. According to this assumption, if only legal norms were better enforced, then children would be better off. But the truth is that law often facilitates social injustice and violence. In fact, every legal interpretation and decision relies on violence. Law realizes itself through physical and symbolic violence, and it occasions violence. It justifies certain forms of violence while prohibiting others. But the law tends to deny the fact that it is violent. And it keeps its violence out of public sight through various legal tools, such as closed hearing, secret evidence, and gagging orders. In addition, the law violently excludes people who don't have legal expertise. In other words, law isn't only a tool for restricting the violence of the establishment. Instead, law also enables, legitimizes, and conceals this violence. Now let's turn to childhood and its violence. Childhood is a social category that confines both children and adults into rigid behaviors and sites. And these distinctions are violent toward young people. The label children limits society's expectation of what they can do and who they can be. Society presumes that simply because of their young age, they're inherently incomplete, ignorant, dependent, vulnerable, unreliable, and impulsive. And this is seen as justifying increased protection and supervision. In this way, social norms perpetuate and supposedly confirm the presumed dependence and ignorance of these young people. And the law plays a central role here as well. For example, the preamble to the Convention on the Rights of the Child states that all children are, and I quote, mentally immature. Now, since this treaty generally defines children as anyone under the age of 18, this means that a third of humanity is stigmatized as being immature. In addition, the Convention on the Rights of the Child fails to give young people access to important activities such as voting. And as we've seen, it also gives adults 
the power to decide if and how to take into account the views of the young. In this way, legal and social norms prevent young people from gaining useful knowledge, from participating in important activities, and from having an equal voice. As a result, the vulnerability and incapability of young people is prolonged, and their life choices are restricted to those that are agreeable to adult decision makers. At the same time, childhood is violent not only toward those we call children, it's also violent toward the people we call adults. Generally speaking, society holds these older people to excessive standards of independence, invulnerability, competence, knowledge, and responsibility. For example, in a recent article, I showed how campaigns to reduce the imprisonment of youth often endorse the imprisonment of adults. These campaigns often describe adults in trouble with the law as incorrigible, blameworthy, and therefore as deserving of imprisonment. So far, we've highlighted the fluidity and violence of both law and childhood. Now let's focus on social actors who are often neglected by research on law and childhood. The first group of actors are non-lawyers. As we'll see, they are fully fledged legal actors. The second group of social actors are people who are formerly adults. As we'll see, they also embody childhood. So when people think of law, they tend to think of legal professionals, such as attorneys or judges or lawmakers or jurists. Accordingly, when people think of law, they also tend to think of certain institutions and texts, such as courts and statutes. But what this common view fails to recognize is that the law isn't simply a set of formal institutions, texts, and professionals. Instead, law is a way of thinking, a way of behaving, and a way of communicating with others. For example, when someone asks if something is lawful, what that person is doing is speaking the language of law. And in this sense, that person is the human face of law. In other words, law is something that anyone can participate in by using concepts of legality and illegality. Now, understanding law as a mode of thinking and behaving can be helpful in several ways. First of all, it takes the discussion beyond questions such as what's the correct interpretation of the law? or who's qualified to speak on law's behalf. In addition, this understanding of legality helps us recognize that when scholars talk about legal issues, they don't simply refer to a pre-given law from a distance. Instead, they actively participate in constructing the law by describing it in particular ways. Also, what becomes clear is that the boundaries of law are porous and elastic. In other words, law is inseparable and indistinguishable from other imagined social fields, such as the media, culture, and politics. What this also means is that the law is constantly embodied and constructed by non-lawyers. And this includes the young people we call children. Here's one example, which comes from my own research. I've examined some cases in which young people were arrested for participating in unauthorized protests. And some of them refused to tell the police their personal details. Among other things, they refused to say how old they were. 
And this created a huge challenge for the legal system. Sometimes it was impossible to know whether the young person who was arrested was over the age of criminal responsibility. And if not, that person wasn't even supposed to be in detention. In this way, these young individuals resisted the desire of the law to know how old every single person is. And by refusing to reveal their ages, they obstructed the efforts of the legal system to enforce each, its age norms on society. As we've seen, the legal agency of non-lawyers hasn't received the academic attention it deserves. Similarly, there's a tendency to associate childhood only with the young people we call children. And even when scholarship on childhood and child rights does discuss adults, it tends to consider only adults who have some responsibility or impact on children. These adults are usually parents, teachers, social workers, physicians, judges, and others who deal with children or who make decisions about children. In contrast, adults who don't have direct respons responsibility or impact on children are rarely examined in scholarship on childhood and child rights. This narrow conception of childhood has been rejected by some childhood scholars. As these scholars argue, childhood indicates certain behaviors and characteristics. Childhood invites certain emotions and certain moral judgments, childhood legitimizes certain modes of control, and it draws boundaries in space and time. In all these ways, childhood is applicable to people of all ages. In my own research, I've examined various ways in which the label childhood is applied to people who are formerly adults. One example comes from one of my books on Israel-Palestine. In the book, I examine how Israeli soldiers are infantilized on those rare occasions where they are prosecuted for abusing or killing Palestinian children. In other words, Israeli courts treat and describe soldiers as children, even though they're formerly adults. This creates a competition in the courtroom between two competing childhoods. On the one hand, there's the childhood of the adult Israeli soldier who is described as a child. And on the other hand, there's the childhood of the Palestinian child who is below the legal age of adulthood. This is only one example of how the law applies the label childhood to the people we usually call adults. And this shows that if we want to understand the relationship between law and childhood, we need to recognize that the human faces of childhood are spread across the age spectrum. In conclusion, we've seen that both critical legal scholarship and critical childhood studies call into question conventional wisdom. They can offer a richer, more critical and more nuanced understanding of both childhood and the law. Now, all of these ideas that we've uh, seen in the video are explained in much greater detail in a publication titled Critical Childhood Studies Meets Critical Legal Scholarship. And the chapter also illustrates each of these ideas through various examples beyond those mentioned in this video. So the insights we've discussed um, open up new questions for us to think about. For example, instead of debating what the law really says or what children really need, we can shift the discussion. We can consider the competing effects of both law and childhood. We can try to reimagine both law and childhood. And we can think if and how both law and childhood should be opposed. Similarly, when we think about children and the law, 
we should pay more attention to those members of society who are non-children, non-lawyers, or both. And we should examine how these individuals embody, enact, and resist both the law and childhood. Obviously, the, there's much more to explore, but hopefully this video has provided some valuable food for thought. Thanks for watching.